voice speaking to the subject matter of transgenderism and women's equality. We're going to have an interview this week. I'm looking forward. Riley Gaines. So I'm looking forward to meeting Riley this week in a video Zoom interview. You spoke of the two boxers. One of those athletes has said she had never been hit that hard. Somebody's going to get hurt. You know, the girls that you mentioned that go, does anybody hear me? Does anybody see me? You want to speak to any of that? Come on, church, let's put our hands together to celebrate the faithfulness of God in this place. We're honored that you're here. We're welcoming all of our campuses right now as a statement of faith and belief that God's brought us together for such a time as this. And I'm good. Good to see you. Hey, good to see you. Thank you so much. And uh, honored that you're here. And as we are a church for every person at every place, Believing that God brings us together for moments like this. One of the things that I love about our house, of what God is leading us to do, is to be a church that responds as the hands and feet of Jesus, specifically to be a church that sees those in need and respond. For those of you that have been watching the news, specifically with Hurricane Helene, that's greatly impacted the southeastern part of the United States. I want you to know that we are in partnership with two primary organizations that we have historically been partnering with, which means that every single year we allocate funds, thousands of dollars, to two particular organizations known as Samaritan's Purse and Convoy of Hope. We, we've been doing that. We've been about that. We'll continue to do that. But in light of what we saw take place in this natural catastrophic event where the death toll continues to increase and there are many people still missing, we felt as if it would be important for us to be a church to give an additional $15,000 to those organizations as they seek to be the front lines on the ground, loving people, especially in a time of uncertainty of all that's going on. Also, I'm grateful to be a part of a church that mobilizes men and women out of our disaster relief ministry and program that will be leaving in just a few short days to go to South Georgia to actually be boots on the ground, come into a community, help cut down some trees, help mud out some homes, and help people get back on their feet again. And so not only are we a church that gives money, we also want to be the hands and feet of Jesus practically and personally by sending a team that will go this week. And that's because of your financial contribution. Come on, church. Can we clap to that? Can we clap just a little bit louder? You don't just give to a church. You give through a church. And because of you giving, we've been able to be a blessing. And I want you to know that one of the best places you can give is to a church that believes they can change the world right here from San Antonio, Texas. And so I wanna just take a moment to pray together. Can we just pray in faith? Heads bowed, eyes closed all across our campuses. God, we thank you. We bless you, we praise you for that you are a sovereign God. And I pray right here, right now, would you use our team that's going to be a blessing? Would you use all the nonprofit entities, the churches, so many incredible people coming alongside of hurting humanity? God, we pray that even now, God, you would allow the resources to get to the right people at the right moments. There's some folks that have just been utterly decimated and devastated, not just in personal loss towards property and possession, but losing loved ones. And God, we pray that you would wrap your strong arms around them, and God, you'd be the comfort to them. God, even right now, I pray against a storm that's out there in the Gulf Coast that's even in a trajectory going in the direction of Florida. God, I, I pray that you would you would begin to allow that storm to dissipate. God, would you put it into a place where there's nobody at? God, I pray in Jesus' name that you would do these things. And all God's people said, amen. 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 One more time. Can we clap together? Would that be all right? Amen. We're grateful that you're here. And if you're here for the very first time, I just want to say that as you've been invited, you've been invited into a reality of what God is extending unto us, which means that the reason why you were invited into this particular space, whatever location you're at, is because somebody invited you, not just because you needed to hear a sermon. By the way, for anybody that's in the room today for the very first time at one of our locations, it's not because of you needed to hear this sermon that somebody invited you. It was more along the lines of the fact that we are a community of people that are imperfect, but there's a God that's perfect, that takes broken pieces and makes masterpieces, and everybody needs somebody to lean on in times of crisis. Everybody needs a 2 a.m. friend. And we don't just grow churches in rows, we grow churches in circles. And we just believe in faith that friends become family in a short period of time. But I also wanna take a moment today to take an opportunity just to clarify the conversation that we're having. It's so important that we come to this subject matter of transgenderism unto women's sports and equality and go ahead and set 
the conversation in the frame of a reality that we are a church that welcomes all people. I need us to also understand that churches historically have taken three of the four postures that I will speak of in just a few seconds. Here's the reason why this is important. You need to know what kind of church you're a part of. And there are three particular stances that churches have made historically towards transgenderism and homosexuality. One is alienation. You're not welcome here. I mean, just go on record. That's not the heart of our house. We say all people are welcome here. That's not who we are. The second stance that most churches have taken is to actually affirm. And what I mean by affirm is to say transgenderism and homosexuality is not a sin and culture is right and the Bible's wrong and we choose to tear those particular pages out of scripture and I'll say that's not the church that we are either. We're a church that stands on the principles of God's word. So we're not affirming of what the Bible calls sin, which by the way, let me just go ahead and step into this conversation. Just like we would not affirm a man that cheats on his wife or a wife that cheats on her husband or people that live in a hookup culture or you're gambling or you're gossiping or slandering. And we can go through a whole list of sins that the Bible talks about, by the way, pretty graphically. And when you think you're doing well, just read a couple more pages and watch what happens in the Bible, all right? Which means that we are not affirming as a church unto what the Bible calls sin, but we are accepting. And what I mean by accepting is all of us are in need of grace and mercy. I'm so grateful I got a Jesus that was always tangled up with some Pharisees that would find themselves being very judgmental and critical to other people's issues. And Jesus, one particular time, goes, hey, while you call out the dust or the speck in someone else's eye, you got a Home Depot log in your own eye. He didn't say Home Depot, but he did say a two by four. And he didn't say two by four. He just said log is what he said in your eye. And so I'm embellishing a little bit, but here, here's what you know to be true. It's so easy to call out everybody else's ish issues, failing to recognize we all got issues at some level. And so as a church, we're, we're not alienating and we're not affirming. We are accepting all of sin, but also need you to know there's some churches that choose to never even talk about it. They just avoid it. And they don't even bring it up. It's like it's not even happening in the world. And we're choosing to be a church that every single year approaches a trending subject and just goes, this is controversial. And let me just say, for those of you that are watching online right now, we've made a very intentional effort for those of you that are watching online or even watching this rebroadcasted sermon that we're not turning off the comments. Let me just pause for a second. We're, we're not just choosing to allow a one-way conversation. We're choosing to be a church that goes, hey, listen, we, we know that this subject matter, anytime we talk about different issues in culture, is, is quite polarizing. But we as the church, we're, we're not hiding anything. We're not running from anything. What we're saying is this is what the word of God says. How do we relate to, to culture? Do we allow culture to define the Bible? Does the Bible define our culture? And we're going, hey, listen, we're, we're, we're not afraid of the subject matter. Does it, does it cause us at times to feel like the elephants in the room? Here's what we're saying. All of us are in need of grace. All of us are in need of mercy. The foot of the cross is level for all people that need a savior. And what we're saying is Jesus is the answer. And I'm not ashamed to say that he is the answer. So as we talk about what kind of church we are, we're, we're not a church that chooses to avoid the subject matter. We're a church that actually chooses to address the subject matter from a biblical perspective, which means our posture is assurance. Assurance of what? Grace and truth. That's who we are. We are a, ch a church that preaches truth but at the same time, grace for all people. We don't allow truth to be fluctuating and fluid based upon personal preferences. We don't choose to tear out particular pages. Here's what we're saying. God, you said it. Your truth is true for all people, all places, all times, and we allow your word to stand. However, let me go on record as saying this. Anytime in a conversation where all of a sudden you see transgenderism, or you may even see homosexuality, immediately there's a group of people that feel as if they're being spotlighted. That's not our heart and intent. Here's what I wanna say. Come back on another weekend and we'll talk about other people. I promise you. <laughs> we'll talk about other people. We're an equal opportunity offender. And I'll be honest with you, there's a lot of moments where I'll even talk about myself and my own issues. Is that okay? Can we just go ahead and say that? So for us, let me also go on record for anybody, and I've had a few, it's not recently, but a few years ago, there were people like, hey, listen, you need to tell these people to leave the church, speaking of transgenders and, and those that practice homosexuality, like, hey, you need to tell them to leave the church. And here, here's the mindset. If your mindset is they need to leave because of what they're doing, here's the truth of the matter, is that if that mindset is the mindset that you have, that's not a reflection of who God is, and it's not a reflection of who we are. And so we're a church that goes, hey, we're gonna stand on truth, all are welcome to come hear the truth.
But in the process of this, we're gonna choose not to demonize and divide, but we're actually gonna go, okay, what does God have to say about the subject matter? So if you got a Bible, you'll see that there's some particular references. I'd love for you to look up these verses. But let me just begin with the target statement. Compassion is caring for someone, not at the detriment of someone else. As we think about biblical clarity, as we enter into a conversation about gender and transgenderism, this is not an all exhausting conversation, by the way. One of the things that you need to know is that in the interview that I had this week with Riley Gaines, it was an hour conversation. I'm gonna show a few couple of clips that I believe will create a moment for you to go, I wanna hear the rest of this. We released the podcast. I don't know if you know this. I'm not a podcast guy. I've been on some podcasts. And, and people were like, Ed, you need your own podcast? And I was like, mm, not really interested in doing that. And then all of a sudden, someone was like, hey, we need to do a trending podcast. I'm so grateful for our team. And we released podcast number one from last weekend, but then we'll put Raleigh Gaines and this interview on that podcast again. You can find it on YouTube, you can find it on Apple, and you can find it on Spotify. And we'll see how the podcast does, but it's called The Trending That's called The Trending Podcast with Pastor, I almost forgot the name of the own podcast, right? The Trending <laughs> Podcast with Pastor Ed. And so you can search that and see the entirety of this conversation. But I wanna speak about biblical clarity. It's in Genesis chapter one, verse 27. You can see this. So God created man in his own image, in the image of God. He created him, male and female. He created them. There's a created order, according to God and his word, that God speaks the universe into existence. The Latin phrase is ex nihilo, out of nothing. And God speaks and the universe comes into existence in fruition of vegetation, plant life, the earth, the, the solar system, the universe, etc. So as God speaks, it happens. But then there was a moment where God scoops up dirt and makes man. Now for all the fellas across our house, across our campuses, you're like, Pastor Ed, that doesn't sound encouraging. But just hang with me for a second. You're like, cool, he made us from dirt. But if God spoke the universe into his existence and he spoke plant life into existence and he spoke animal life into existence, would you agree with me he could have spoken man into existence? And the answer is yes. But he scoops up dirt, watch this, let me just slow my roll for a second because it illustrates the very fact that God cares so much about it, this will be the first time he ever touched something. Which means as he scoops up dirt, he makes man. As intricate and complex as we can imagine, as Adam was now brought into existence by the breath of God, the hand of God, we see that we are fearfully and wonderfully made. Even women coming out of man, out of Adam. And as we think about how the Bible would say man and woman was created by God, which means God defines gender, not culture. Male, female. And as we think about male and female, female comes out of male, which is interesting because it's the first anesthesia, first surgical procedure. Here's the moment. Adam's named all the animals. How cool was that? He names all the animals, like names them all, duckbill, platypus, and then gets so tired. He's like ant, like ox, cow. I got, I got thank y'all for laughing at that, the tip jars on the stage, right? So, but, but when we think about the, the fact that Adam is naming the animals, He's, he's seeing something. There's male and female, and there's babies. Male, female, babies. And then he recognizes there's nothing compatible unto himself. God has said, it is good, it is good, it is good, it is good, it is good. And then he says, it's not good that man should be alone. So he awakens Adam to the need of compatibility and communion. Perfect world, no sin. Man and God chilling. How amazing would that be? One dude, God, kicking it. Hey, God, what you want to do today? I mean, and Adam goes, there's no one like me. And God goes, it's not good for you to be alone. He's with God. And God goes, let me make you a helper. Surgical procedure, wakes up. Hebrew culture would teach us this, that when he sees, when Adam sees Eve for the very first time, actually Hebrew would teach us that he sang to her. It probably sounded like this, mm, mm. Mm, you're the most amazing thing I've ever seen in my entire life. God, you're amazing, but hello. This is like pre-fig leaves, you know what I'm saying? So uh, this is a moment like, my God talking about you, right? So you are amazing. The two become one. They leave, weave, 
cleave. And we see that they operate, watch this, in equality, man and woman, equal before God with different roles and responsibilities, but not God loving one more than the other, but actually it's God that elevates woman to an equal standing before God with man. But man has the responsibility to do what? To be a pastor, provider, protector. To all you single ladies in the room, I've said this to you before, I'll say it again. Two requirements for the man that ought to be in your life. Love Jesus, got a job. <laughs> Love Jesus, got a job. But let me take that a little bit further. He ought to be the pastor, provider, and protector of your house. And when you and I think about what the standard of, of a man that loves God should be, it means that we lay down our life as Christ laid down his life for the church. But as we think about biblical clarity, you can actually see that when woman was created for man, the Bible says, I'll make a helper fit for you. That word helper does not mean subservient. It doesn't mean that she's not a servant as to seek to be an encouragement. It doesn't mean that the man should be a servant or seek to be an encouragement for his woman. But ultimately, it's in this relationship that you understand that man was incomplete until God gave him a wife. It's an interesting statement. That word helper means that he cannot be all that God has called him to be unless there's a woman in his life that completes who he is. Let me say it to you in Spanish. I've been saying it for 26 years to my bride. Tu me completas, forgive my gringo Spanish right now, but it is a straight up statement. You are the completer of me. I am not able to be all that God has called me to be without you in my life. And when two people wake up every day to fan the flame of the gift of God in their heart, it's a relationship that cannot be stopped. And I need you to know that when you and I think about when woman comes into the life of man, it's because of the fact that they completed each other, not just biologically, but relationally, communicative relationship that allows them to flourish together as one. The Bible teaches this high view of woman. God is pro-woman. God, God is pro-man. But understand if there were different genders, he would have said it in Genesis chapter one and Genesis chapter two. This is the tension. If we are gonna be held captive to a biblical conviction, we have to wrestle with this. But as we speak to the wrestling, it's not a wrestling issue. I believe it because God says it and it makes it difficult for some to receive it and process it. Just like you can ignore gravity, but gravity reminds you often, even if you ignore it, it's still true. And as we think about what makes it true, we can ignore the reality of biology, but at the end of the day, if you were in a, in a wreck, and I don't speak that over your life, and they were trying to determine who you are, like who was this individual in this catastrophe, they would do a DNA test to figure out if you're a man or a woman. It's a DNA test that reveals that, chromosomes. And so this speaks to the reality of science confirming what we're talking about. This is called genotype. This is in your notes. I won't really fully go into the scientific explanation of, of what makes a man and what makes a woman, but can we agree that at the chromosomal level, for example, there's 100 trillion cells estimated in the human body. Nobody knows the exact number. It's infinite in number, it feels like. But in each cell is six feet of genetic information. I, I, I know for some of you up there in the mezzanine or maybe you're watching online, you don't really know how tall I am standing on this stage, but I, I'm 6'2". So six feet of information in each singular cell of DNA material that makes up who you are, genotype. If you're a female, XX chromosome. If you are a male, XY chromosome. Genotypes lead to phenotypes. Phenotypes is determined by your genotype. Genotype, if you are a female, you are XX chromosome. If you are male, you are XY chromosome. That phenotype, so if you're a male, XY, then you're gonna have male features. That's phenotype. If you're a female, XX, you're gonna have female features, not just externally, but internally as well. All of those things are important because science confirms, whether you believe in God or not, science confirms gender. Let me, just, let me just say this. If, if there was multiple genders, then there would be different chromosomal connections and that would go to the pundit square and you go, oh, but it really just goes X, 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 Y and God goes, that's what I've done. 46 chromosomes, 23 from father, 23 from mother, 46 makes up who you are. Phenotype, DNA determines organs, body parts and features. But here's what we have to wrestle with. 
This is where society goes, no, no, that's not what we're talking about. It's a, re it's a redefining of a statement. But let me give a biblical statement, a statement of faith. God defines gender not separate from sex, but one and the same. Let me tell you why this is important. Sex is what biology says. Gender is what your brain says. It's how people identify, if I could put it real simply. Our cultural definition, biology, biological sex does not determine gender for they are mutually exclusive, not the same. Did you see this? God goes sex and gender are the same. But culture says, no, 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 your body and your brain, they can be in disagreement. Gender identity is a biological sex does not determine gender for they are mutually exclusive. And here's what's interesting. Denny Burke said it this way, the implication of this teaching is clear. If a person's body says male, such as XY chromosome, science determines that, DNA, DNA test confirms that, and your brain says female, then here's what Denny Burke would say, and I'm in agreement, then your brain is wrong. Because in every cell, listen to me, you can change every feature of your body, you can change the way you look, but deep down inside of who you are, there's a hundred trillion cells that say something different. You can look different on the outside, but you take that one cell, it is the imprint of God, and I'm gonna just make this statement, God didn't make a mistake when he made you. You are fearfully made in his image. And you may be wrestling with that, and we, we want to speak to that because, because, and I know for some of you in the room, you're like, okay, but what about gender dysphoria and intersex? Gender dysphoria is real and intersex is real. Gender dysphoria, by definition, is when a person's emotional or psychological identity does not match their biological sex at birth. That means that there's a level of confusion. It happens with children. That's called early onset gender dysphoria. There's cultural onset gender dysphoria, such as social media, peers embracing transgender behavior as popular or trendy, or communities and celebrations of uniqueness creates gatherings and people groups that you find acceptance in. Those are real, but there are many that struggle with what's known as a frustrated onset gender dysphoria. This is a frustration and anger due to the feeling and sentiment of what is felt is not wanted. Let me say it this way. There is a battle. There is friction. There is tension with what my body is saying biologically and what my brain is saying. And I feel as if I'm in a prison. We got to be really careful in moments like this because there are really a lot of folks that are struggling with gender dysphoria. However, our society has a fix for this. Sexual reassignment surgery. That's what they would say. And that's dangerous. Here's the reason why, because while people are working through this and really trying to figure out who they are, we got to be patient with people, understanding that some folks, it's not just clear and instant, but sometimes there's a process. We gotta be grace reminding of these individuals that God didn't make a mistake when he made you. Sexual reassignment surgery is not the answer. Your brain's saying one thing, your body's saying something different. Can we walk alongside of you, help you see all that God's called you to be? Which by the way, if the church is not a safe place to have this conversation, then where is it? And I'll tell you, culture goes, we got an answer for it. Have surgery or have what would be known as hormonal suppressants. Which by the way, let me ask you a question. Interesting, we gotta hold lawmakers accountable because 15 year olds are, are able to drive with a permit, 16 year olds drive with a driver's license, 18 year olds are able to buy cigarettes. I think that's now probably moving to 21. I, I, someone just told me here recently that may be changing. But when we think about people able to rent a car, 25 years old, get a tattoo, 18 years old, we have standards of age. We should hold every lawmaker accountable that tries to allow a child to have sexual reassignment surgery without parental consent. Counselors should not be able to talk to children without their moms and dads know, know what's going on. And we gotta hold any doctor accountable that lets a child walk in and they have surgery without even telling somebody. And we're starting to see that there are people going, I made permanent decisions to my body that I wish I now could go back and nobody fought for me. Nobody spoke up for me. Well, welcome to CBC. That's exactly what we're doing. That's what we're trying to do. So as we think about gender comparison, gender comparison, American College Sports and Medicine, which by the way, is not a Christian conversation. This is just science, y'all. Releases an expert consensus 
Title of the article and dissertation, The Biological Basis of Sex Differences in Athletic Performance. Biologically, I'll put this in the notes. You can read this for yourself, biologically and physically. Biologically, sex is a, is a determinant of athletic performance. Adult males are faster, stronger, more powerful than females because of fundamental sex differences in anatomy and physiology dictated by sex chromosomes. Physically, adult males are stronger, more powerful, faster than females of similar age and training status. The sex difference in athletic performance where endurance or muscular power is required is roughly 10 to 30% depending on the event. Now, somebody may be in the room watching online, one of our campuses, you're like, Pastor Ed, that's the most sexist thing I think I've ever heard. You're like, are, are you saying that, that men are always stronger than women? No, because I've met some women that flat out can get it done. Every time I go to the gym, I'm reminded of the power of women. I ran a marathon in 2008. Let me just give a little clarify here. I ran a marathon in 2008, got passed by a six month pregnant woman. You go, Ed, how did you know she was six months, not seven months, six months, not three months? How did you know? Well, that race was in December of 2008. My wife scheduled a photographer to come to the house and all of a sudden she walked in the door. I was like, you look really familiar. She's like, I've never met you before. I was like, well, did you run the marathon at St. Jude? Like, she goes, yeah, not my best time. I was six months pregnant. I was like, you did better than me. Matter of fact, you passed me and made it look like I was running in mud in that moment. She goes, it wasn't my best time. She goes, I was six months pregnant. I also was training with two kids. She goes, I used to push a stroller, give them a bunch of sandwiches and an iPad, and I'd run around the community for multiple hours. I was like, I don't know who you are, but you're built different. <laughs> so are there moments where, where women can flat out dominate men in things? Absolutely. This study is over a massive number of people competing in athletics. It speaks of a human body. It, it speaks of the fact of what's going on just with lung capacity, heart rate, size, muscle mass, skeletal structure, et cetera. So when you and I think about this conversation, it's an interesting statement. Dr. Gregory Brown from the University of Nebraska said this. This is fascinating to me. He said, for example, 2017 alone, 5,000 males, including some under the age of 18, ran a 400 meter, that is a dash, multiple times faster than personal best of US Olympic gold medalist, Sonia Richards, Ross, and Allison Felix. Watch this. These two women won medals in that race. This scientist, this researcher, Dr. Brown says, 5,000 men and even young men ran that time faster. But in a women's category, that is the fastest in the world. Put that time in a men's category, and here's what you'll find out, 5,000 people could have done that. Does it diminish women? No, but in their own category, it's awesome. And it should be celebrated, and it should be esteemed. That's the point. I got a little bit more time in this service, but there was a weightlifter by the name of Ann Andres, who was a biological male, identified as a woman, and she goes into a Canadian powerlifting competition, which is a master's division, and her total weight in squat, bench, and deadlift, her final score was 597.5 kilograms, which by the way, was 400 pounds more than the second place finisher. Now the reason why this is important and I draw this as a reference is because that record set by a biological male competing as a transgender woman now has erased a historical record that will never be beat again, which means that women are competing for a particular goal they'll never be able to accomplish because it really was a man competing as a transgender woman in that category that erased that historical record. This is the concern. And I wanna just make this comment. Typically when a man identifies as a woman in sports, specifically there's an advantage of biological makeup. Notice the key component here. The individuals that have made national news as transgender athletes who won championships, competed at an elite level in state championships, national championships, or world championships are competing in female divisions as trans athletes who would have not qualified or had a lower ranking in men's divisions and those men's divisions didn't rank, didn't win, didn't podium, didn't platform, didn't get the award, but all of a sudden find themselves in a lower national average, all of a sudden jump into another division and they're winning this. This is the concern. This is the issue. And when we talk about the issue, 
This conversation with Riley Gaines is really interesting to me because in 2022, she was ranked as the seventh or eighth fastest swimmer in the nation. She swam for the University of Kentucky. She was a senior at the time in 2022. She was studying to be a dental surgeon. That's what she was studying to be. But in 2022, she would say that there would be a transgender swimmer that they didn't really know was transgender, just Leah Thomas was her name, and she comes out of nowhere. But for three years at the University of Penn, she was, he was a swimmer competing as a biological male that was ranked about 400th in the nation that now comes over into the women's category and is beating women by a full body length. If you've ever watched women swimming or any male swimming, it's decided by nanoseconds, so close. Those moments where somebody outswims somebody by a whole body length would be the equivalent of somebody getting beat by 30 or 40 in basketball or in football. So this would be called blowout wins in that category. And that's what was happening in 2022. And Riley Gaines would say this, we had no idea who she was. She said the swimming community, and you'll see this in the podcast, the swimming community is such a close-knit community. You've grown up competing against the best swimmers in the world. And all of a sudden in 2022, who is this person that's winning everything? But in the national championship, national championship, Riley Gaines would say this, I tied Leah Thomas. She's been beating people full body length. But watch this, their fingers hit the wall at the same exact time. And when it came to award the trophy, now once more, it's a tie. When it came to awarding the trophy, I want you to hear what Riley Gaines said happened in that moment. Turn your eyes to the screen, check out this testimony. Thing was after we tied, we went behind the awards podium where the NCAA official looks at both Thomas and myself again, him towering over me. And the official says, great job, you two. Uh, but you tied and we only have one trophy. And so we're gonna give that trophy to Leah. Sorry, Riley, you don't get one. We don't really account for ties. We don't have two trophies, so you don't get one. And I just, mm. I, I was so taken aback in that moment, right? I mean, my, my heart rate was still high, having just competed. My adrenaline was still pumping. And so the first thing that I thought ended up being the first thing that I said. Uh, and the first thought that I had was, isn't this everything that Title IX was passed to to prevent from happening? What do you mean you're going to give the trophy to the man? and the women's 200 free. Uh, to which, of course, he didn't have a response. They didn't give him a script of what to say when someone asked why. And so he kind of stumbled on his words and he's he's tried different excuses, but ultimately, and I, and I appreciate his honesty, he looked at me and he said, Riley, and he, he sounded sad, right? I could tell he didn't even believe what he was about to say, but he said, Riley, I'm so sorry, but we've been advised as an organization that when photos are being taken, uh, the trophy has to be in Leah's hands. Uh, you can pose with this one, but you have to give yours back. Leah takes the trophy home. You go home empty-handed, end of story. Um, that was it. That was all I needed to hear. Uh, it was in that moment I realized, and, and we knew all season. We knew all season the unfair competition was wrong. We knew the locker room was wrong. We knew the silencing that we were facing was wrong. But it wasn't until this official reduced everything we had worked our entire lives for down to a photo op to validate the feelings and the identity of a man at the expense of our own. Uh, like I said, that's when I, I stopped waiting for a coach to say something. I stopped waiting for someone within the NCAA, someone with political power, some other swimmer. That's when I realized this has to come from us as women, as female athletes. How could we expect someone to stand up for us if we're not even willing to stand up for us? In that statement, if we're not willing to stand up for us, then who will? Once more, this conversation is important to me, not just because I'm a girl dad. And I am a girl dad. I got three daughters. This conversation is important to me because of the fact of what I would later find out as I began to study the progression of feminism. For those of you that do not know what the, the feministic movement has been. Now, there's a lot of different variants of the feministic movement. But when we talk about feminism by definition... It's defined as the historical advocacy of women's rights on the basis of equality with men. What does that mean? Right to vote? Ladies, I think that's a big deal. When it, when it comes to equal employment and making sure that if you're able to do what a, a man should do, it's not so much about male or female, it's whether or not who does the job. You should be able to be equally and fairly compensated. Ladies, I think that's a massive deal. I think you ought to be paid what you ought to be paid. I, I think that's important. I, I think that's worthy of a conversation. 
And not just a conversation, but action. I think education equality, maternity leave, body positivity, domestic violence support, hashtag me too, sexism, all these things are important to helping women understand what God has been saying since Genesis chapter one, that you are women of worth and value. God is pro-woman, and I need you to know that. And so as we talk about feminism, feminism by definition with two particular laws, Title VII and Title IX. Title VII was brought into fruition, Civil Rights Act of 1964 that helped a lot of people, specifically in race, color, tribe, and tongue. But when it comes to not just ethnicity, but it's also about women's equality. Title VII, then Title IX. Title IX, 1972, prohibits disparities and discrimination in education, resources, sports, based on sex. But I put this star here in the notes because now it includes gender identity or gender expression. Remember how culture defines this? That biology, your, your body says one thing, chromosomes, but your brain says something else, so you get to identify as what gender you decide to be, which, by the way, is not... E either one, it's, it could be one or the other, or there's multiple gender identities. Some would say there's up to 72 gender identities. Some would say there's more than four. I mean, the number is all over the map and it continues to change. Here's what I'm saying to you. The conversation that's so important in regards to the progression of feminism is that feminism was helping people understand women should be treated equally and fairly. Now, when Title IX now, now includes discrimination, not just protecting women. That's what 1972 was about. You cannot discriminate against biological women. Now, there, there's been the tweak in this law that says you cannot discriminate against a biological male who identifies as a transgender athlete. So you cannot prevent them from competing in an athletic competition because that's discrimination. Here's the statement. It's hypocritical. Yeah. And I wanna go ahead and be on record in saying this. Your effort of inclusion in trans athletes is at the exclusion of women who've been fighting for years to be able to have equality. That's the challenge. And I'm just gonna go ahead and say this. And those who have been leaders and proponents in the feministic movement that have been claiming equal pay, and yes, and yes, so many NBA players, Angel Reese, Caitlin Clark, WNBA, filling up arenas. Pay these women what they're worth. But here's what you need to understand is at the same time in this feministic messaging of equal pay, there's silence from many who were a part of helping found the 1972 law of what was known as Title IX. And here's what I'm gonna go on record saying. The silence is deafening. It's deafening. Because here's what you need to know. It is a tremendous challenge not just to equal pay, but also when it comes to safety, when it, when it comes to protection of these athletes. I want you to turn your eyes to the screen and listen to Riley Gaines speak about her testimony concerning the silence of feminism. Check out this video. But I have been most shocked um, to see the, the remarkably ironic display of silence from the feminist movement. Uh, you think of the women who fought for Title IX, really. These same women, the women who wore the pink hats, uh, the, women, the women who marched in front of the Capitol. These, are not, th these women actually aren't even being silent now. They're the ones leading the charge in dismantling Title IX. You think of uh, incredible athletes, like you said, we could list a, a, a whole host of them. But you think of people like Billie Jean King. I mm -hmm. mean, this is someone... Really, this is who we have to accredit Title IX to. She played in the battle of the sexes and she won and it was this huge feat for women. And to your point, not even just, not even just female athletes, but women in the workplace, it, within personal relationships, whatever it is, it, it, was a, 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 it took women forward. Um, but now this same woman is actively working to undermine everything she once fought for. Speaking of equal pay, think of someone like Megan Rapino. Uh, this is someone who has has prided herself her entire career really she said the the biggest accomplishment she's had in her entire life her entire career is fighting for equal pay well now she's the one who's writing in parades issuing statements signing on to letters to congress 
urging them to vote against the Protection of Women and Girls in Sports Act. I mean, the list the list goes on with these these names who have been. Um, it's silent, but but really, it feels it feels like a Babylon B headline or like mm. a South Park episode or like an SNL skit, which, which is objectively meant to be funny. You want to laugh at it, and that's kind of the again the gut the gut instinct that I had until I realized this has real effects. Uh, there are real consequences to to what these women. Um, those who call themselves feminists um, has real consequences what they're doing. J.K. Rowling, I'm sure you've heard that name before. She's written the books of Harry Potter. She makes the quote, she says, looping the fight for trans rights into the fight for women's rights is harmful to the feminist movement. Why? Because you're creating inclusion at the expense of exclusion. It works against itself, which means biological men will now be put in positions in female categories and spaces and places that will take away from women who have been working so hard. She goes on to say it this way. She says, if sex isn't real, and what I mean by sex, I'm, I'm not talking about reproduction, I'm talking about chromosomal reality of how God defines us. If sex isn't real, the lived reality of women's global efforts are erased. That's her statement. Well, one of the conversations I had with Riley was specifically concerning safety locker room protocols, and this was interesting to me because I think it's really important that you understand the real examples. Riley Gaines is an advocate for women's sports. She's on a mission to give clarity to what's been taking place, hoping that what happened to her wouldn't happen to somebody else. But as she's been in this role and responsibility, which by the way has come with a tremendous amount of hate. It's been interesting to me, she was on the campus of San Francisco State giving a presentation by the way, she was invited into that environment by a student body. In the middle of her presentation, a group of men dressed up in, in dresses took over the room, cut all the lights out, roughed her up a little bit, and then the security had to take her into a, another room. And these individuals, these men dressed up as women, held her hostage in a room for multiple hours, and they negotiated a ransom with the president to be able to release her from fear in a room. And she said, this was most alarming is that the president of San Francisco State would say, I commend the student body and how they responded to Riley Gaines' message. It's an interesting conversation because as she travels across the country, she actually has to be protected because there will be people that will protest outside of her, out of her hotel room. All she's seeking to do is give advocacy for women for all the things that they worked hard for. But here's what I wanna show you. I wanna show you this part of the interview. Once more, the whole interview will be on the podcast. But what you need to hear is that these are real examples that are taking place. Turn your eyes to the screen. Check out this video. I can't even really put into words, right, the feelings of... Uh, uh, first, let me set the scene, actually. Okay, a, a swimming locker room is not necessarily a place of modesty, right? Your, your suit that you're putting on, your racing suit, it's, it's skin tight, it's paper thin. It takes about at least 20 minutes to really poke and prod yourself into these suits, which you know, is 20 minutes of, of, of what you're fully exposed. And a locker room's not a comfortable place in general, but, but growing up a swimmer, you almost become comfortable being vulnerable in that environment. Um, but I can't even tell you how that vulnerability is stripped, right? I, I have my, my back turned, putting on my suit. Locker room, it's a place of buzzing and chatter and laughter, especially at, at the NCAA championships. I mean, this is the one year, the one meet all year. You get to see your friends from all over the country. So, so lots of talking, lots of chatter, and have my back turned, and all of a sudden it gets dead silent in this locker room. And I thought, that's weird. And I, I you know, still putting on my suit, and all of a sudden I hear a man's voice. And instinctually, Ed, me and all of the other girls, we, we instinctually cover ourselves, whether it's with your hand or your clothes or your towel, whatever it is. And, and I, you know, kind of swiftly turn my head and I have to look up because, again, he's towering over every girl in the locker room. And there's a man standing at six foot four, 22 years old, taking off his clothes, stripping down to nothing, fully naked, inches away from where we were simultaneously fully undressed. I mean, inches away from us. It was, it's awkward, it's embarrassing, it's uncomfortable, it's humiliating, it's an utter violation is what it was. It, it was feelings of betrayal. I felt betrayed 
I mean, these were organizations, the NCAA and my university that I loved, that I trusted, that I believed had my best interests, organizations that I dedicated my life to. And without even a second thought, without even bare minimum forewarning us, they threw our rights to privacy entirely out of the window. And I remember I left the locker room, like I said, immediately and approached one of the officials on the pool deck. And I said, you know, I, I understand the, the guidelines in place for the competition, but what is the guideline that allows a man into our locker room? And I will never forget. He so nonchalantly responded back with, oh, uh, well, we actually got around this by making the locker rooms unisex. And I was so taken aback. And I, uh, the first thing that I, I had thought in my head was, okay, well, you realize by admitting you had to change the rules of the locker room, you're admitting this person isn't a woman, right? Otherwise you wouldn't have had to change the rules. But secondly, unisex, so any man, not just the ones who identify as women, any man, any coach, any parent, any official, any pervert who wanted to be in that changing space, had full legal access of being in there and we weren't even forewarned about it. There was no other place. There was no place that we as women could have changed on that pool deck that Thomas did not have access to. I remember one girl came up to me. Now uh, she's a swimmer for, for NC State. She's a, a 31 time all American. She's incredible. Uh, and she came up to me and she was smiling ear to ear. And she said, Riley, I found somewhere to change. It's a janitor's closet. You know, it, it's, yeah, I'm kind of changing next to a wet mop, but I, I don't have to worry about a, a man walking in on me. I'm so grateful. And she was smiling so big. And I remember in that moment, oh my gosh, did she just tell me she's grateful to undress in a janitor's closet? And this is what they call progress. It's And to speak very briefly to the safety thing, um, just because this is, we're seeing this continually, that volleyball player you referenced that plays at San Jose State University. I've talked to girls who he's given career ending concussions. Uh, I've talked to girls who have had all of their teeth knocked out in field hockey, have had to undergo facial reconstruction surgery to, to literally reconstruct their face. A girl in North Carolina is partially paralyzed. It's, it's been two years now, and she's still partially paralyzed on her, her right side. She has to have special accommodations for testing in school. She was supposed to play softball in college. She can't play anymore. Uh, her vision is impaired. Her memory is impaired. She has to have part of her pituitary gland removed out of her brain because of a volleyball injury from a male. Um, the list goes on in the science, again, to, to just touch on that too. Not that this even necessarily needs to be explained because kindergartners, anyone with a brother or sister understands this. Um, <clears throat> but we often hear the, the debate of you know testosterone levels and if, if a man can get their testosterone levels down to a, a certain threshold, then it's equivalent. Um, First of all, even if a man had zero nanomoles per liter of testosterone, there are still advantages like lung capacity, heart size, of course, limb, limb length, even the size of Thomas's feet. He's like a size 20 shoe standing on the block. His foot takes up the entire block. Um, all of these things don't change with, with any sort of testosterone limit. Um, and even so, women aren't a testosterone threshold. That's not what makes us women, so. Well, this conversation, there's so much more to talk about, but you go, Pastor Ed, what do we do? Like, how, how do we move forward? Well, first, I believe that as we think about the disparity that's beginning to happen already, in an effort of creating inclusion, it's at the expense of exclusion. Do you remember a couple years ago, we hosted the, not here at CBC, but this was at the Alamo Dome, the Final Four for Women. Do you remember that? Do you remember the, the controversy uh, around this event? It wasn't the fact that we were hosting the Final Four, it was, the element of what was taking place in the accommodations for these women. How many of you remember that conversation where an athlete from a school took pictures and video of the workout facility that was dedicated to the women? And then the comparison that was given of another man that was at a final four in the comparison between the workout facilities. All the swag, all the merch, all the equipment for men but then this little workout space dedicated to women in our own city, which by the way, wasn't a city issue, this was an NCAA issue, that the workout facility that we're given was very comparable and equivalent to like a Hampton Inn, a Super 8, a Holiday Inn, like a little workout space. And the disparity that took place, 
Women have been working tirelessly just to be seen as equal in these spaces. That's just one example that happened in our own city. However, you throw this level of discrimination towards biological men for the inclusion of transgender athletes, then what ends up happening in these moments is that actually women feel as if there's no advocacy, there's no help. You go, so Ed, what do we do? Here's the statement. If you're going to compete in a women's division, then you must be biologically a woman. A woman. You, you must be tested as XX chromosome. That, that is fundamental. So DNA test, which by the way is not evasive, it's a, it's a swab. It's a swab. Are you biologically a female? If not, no matter your gender identity, no matter what you identify, no matter what your brain is telling you, if you biologically are not a female, you cannot compete in the female division. You must compete, as your chromosomes say, in the male division. That is important. Number two, we must hold accountable all lawmakers that seek to create inclusion for trans athletes into women's division at the exclusion of them. Those are little things. This is why voting matters. This is why your voice matters. This is why you being informed of what's taking place because policymakers are making decisions for us unbeknownst to us because we go, watch this, because we don't wanna be political. I, I wanna make this statement. Every time I do trending, there's always a moment of, Pastor Ed, this just feels like it's political. Listen to me. When politics tries to be spiritual, then the church has a responsibility to speak up about what is spiritual in the conversation. And what's spiritual is that God has deemed man and woman. And science proves that. But we live in a culture that goes, trust the science. But yet the science keeps moving. So as we look back to the answer of all of this, convictional kindness is so important, I wanna make this statement, is that oftentimes in conversations like this, we allow people that we don't know to actually demonize the people that we do know. And so we cannot allow people in places that speak, that inform and educate to actually cause us to hate people that we don't even know. And here's the truth of the matter, convictional kindness. There are a lot of transgenders and a lot of homosexuals that go, you know what? What I heard on the screen today and what I'm hearing, I'm not for either. So we can't put everybody into one category specifically towards transgenderism and homosexuality go, they, they think this is all right. There are a lot of transgenders and a lot of homosexuals that go, yeah, unisex bathrooms, that's, that's unacceptable. Or, or biological men competing in women's sports, yeah, that's, that's illogical. So let's not put everybody in the same category. So let's be real careful just to not lump people in, in just this ideology that they all believe the same way. Not true, not true. So let us be informed enough to have conversations with people. Let us be informed enough not to demonize people and let's at the same time practice what it looks like to live in convictional kindness. Here's the reason why. Because the world will use messages against us. If you say you love God, then you should love all people. Totally. Love all people. Absolutely. But if we disagree, does that mean that I hate you? No. Actually, being loving is telling people the truth. To not tell people the truth is actually the most unloving thing you can actually ever do is to not tell them the truth. But could we be people, as Jesus people, that go, you know what, we fundamentally disagree, and it happens every time I speak on the subject matter. People walk up to me and go, Pastor Ed, I disagreed with everything you said, but I know you love me, and thank you that you don't judge me. It's like, absolutely not, why would I? Why would I? Here's the reason why. I need grace, you need grace. I need God, you need God, and we're in this together. Here's what we have to be. In this world, there are people that are pressing and pushing messages like tolerance. But have you seen this? I don't know if you've noticed this. The people that preach the message of tolerance, the moment you disagree with them, they become intolerant towards you, but yet their message is tolerance. So it, it seems, if I could say it this way, a little opposite, isn't it, of what you're saying. But yet let's be people that speak truth and love, that we understand that Christ is the best example of what this looks like. By the way, Jesus talks to a woman that's caught in the act of adultery. You know what he said to her? Go and sin no more. Did he affirm her adulterous lifestyle? Not one bit. In love, he goes, don't sin no more. 
to watch this. He goes, but I don't condemn you. Truth, grace. Jesus hung out with Zacchaeus, a swindler, a hustler, an extortionist, taking people's money. And Jesus goes, can I come into your house? You know how much ridicule he got for hanging out with sinners? And which, by the way, whether you clap or don't clap, I praise God for the fact that Jesus hung out with sinners because that meant if I was alive at his, his time, he'd have hung out with me. He'd have hung out with you. But he goes to his house and in his presence, John 1, 14 says, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And it says, and, and we beheld him full of grace, full of truth. So Jesus, by his presence, watch this. He didn't affirm lifestyles. He confronted them. But he did it in love and grace. And when I got something so much better for you than this, this is who we got to be. So let's pray together. I'm going to ask our campus pastors to join me on the stage in their locations. And so with heads bowed, eyes closed, I'm going to pray. And as soon as I say amen, we're going to turn this over to the campuses. And then we're going to have a moment in this room. Father God, we thank you for your word. We know that it's true. And God, I, I pray that our hearts will be receptive to receive what you have in store for us. Thank you for your faithfulness to us, your goodness. Thank you that God, in our own sin, you came with grace. Grace came running, and we thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Now on this campus, at this moment, if you don't know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, the greatest decision you could ever make is to give your life to Jesus. I'm gonna invite our prayer team to come stand at the front. If you would go, I wanna know this Jesus, why don't you come talk to one of our teammates? Also, for those of you that are going, I need somebody to talk to. I need somebody to pray with. Out here in the lobby space, care and support is a place that you can go to. But let's stand together. We're going to close in prayer. If you need to talk to somebody about your relationship with Jesus, you need to talk to somebody, whatever you're facing, regardless of the subject today, let the people of God minister to you. Father, we love you. We bless you. We praise you. You're a good God. And I thank you, Father, in moments like this, that we have a church that desires to receive and hear truth, even sometimes when it's hard, in Jesus' name. And all God's people said amen and amen. God bless you, church. We'll see you next weekend. Hey, my name's Ed Newton, pastor at Community Bible Church here in San Antonio, Texas. Thank you so much for even turning on to our YouTube channel. And if you're not subscribing right now at Community Bible Church here in San Antonio, Texas, you got to subscribe. Here's the reason why. We believe that God's given us a message rooted in his word, empowered by the Holy Spirit, that would be an encouragement to you. And if you're not subscribing right now, you gotta stop what you're doing and hit that button. Also, here's what I'd say to you. Every time you watch, would you drop some comments? Let us know where you're watching from, how the message impacted you, and how we could pray for you. And would you do us a favor? One of the things that we believe oftentimes is bless people, bless people. And if this message blesses you, how about you send it to somebody else and ask them to click the subscribe button as well. And if you are planning any trip to the state of Texas, hear me when I say this, you can't come to Texas without coming to see us in San Antonio. I'd love to meet you face to face. And as always, until we meet again, much love.